first welcome everybody to the latest in our Neuroscience and Education webinar series. And we are very, very excited today to um, have joining us Dr. Douglas Gentile. And Dr. Gentile is a developmental psychologist. Uh, he's a research scientist, an award-winning educator. He has the um, uh, distinguished, uh, distinct honor, I guess, of being one of the best 300 professors in the United States, according to a Random House Princeton Review survey. And I think we could go ahead and switch the slide, Sarah. And um, anyway, he's, he uh, has done a tremendous amount of research on the effects of mass media in children, on uh, adolescents, and adults. He uh, researches a variety of topics, including media violence, educational media, video games, advertising, media ratings, and technology addictions. And um, that's a lot. I don't think we can probably cover all that ground today, but we're going to do the very best we can. Um, he has also written a couple of books, which you're seeing here, Media Violence in Children and Video Game and the uh, in Adolescence, as well as uh, numerous articles and book chapters. Um, I also learned when I was on his website recently that he has a monthly radio show uh, in which he and other experts provide scientifically based advice for parents on a range of issues. And that's wonderful because I believe we have parents on our webinar today, as well as teachers and administrators and clinicians and, and really a whole variety of people. Uh, I think this is a very timely topic that should be of interest to a lot of people. So, Dr. Gentile, are you there? I am. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We met uh, originally in January in California, and uh, we were very impressed. And um, so we're just really excited to bring it. Um, here today. So I'm gonna st I think we'll start off with media violence, since that is something that just is, seems to be on the news every other day. Um, if it's not real violence caused by media violence, then it's media violence in and of itself. And uh, when we, as consumers of media and people who are concerned about our kids in school and things like that, think about uh, the impact, we tend to think about incidents like, you know, killings, um, and the, that mimic what was portrayed in the media and the kinds of horrific events that we've seen in the news lately. But when you um, talk about the impact, you really look at a whole spectrum of behaviors. And I, what I did was sort of adapt an image from your book on media violence in children, which is on the next slide. And um, I'm not sure that this completely does it justice, but could I ask you to just talk about the concept here and why it's so important? Sure. I think uh, one of the problems when we're trying to understand the effects of media violence is that we get most of our information about it from the media, and um, and that immediately means that we start focusing really on the extremes. So we almost only talk about it in this country when there's been some terrible tragedy like a school shooting. But that's really the wrong time to talk about it because that's not what the effect is. The effect is on everyday aggression, uh, the unkind ways that people treat each other in, say, seventh grade, or the spreading rumors, or uh, uh, you know, what we might even, you know, maybe as far up as bullying behaviors. And so one way of thinking about this is uh, shown here in my metaphorical aggression thermometer. And the idea is that... Uh, if we, you know, thought about uh, aggression, you know, way down at the cold end, kids are always polite and respectful. And as it starts to heat up, maybe they'd be rude from time to time or have some, you know, hostile thoughts, but they wouldn't really act on them. But they'd start, they'd start fantasizing and thinking about it more. And then it might start spilling out in their behavior as they think about it more. You might see them being a little more willing to say something unkind or to uh, be... Uh, sarcastic or, um, you know, or, or just straight out insulting. Um, but only once it really starts getting up to the hotter end do kids even start having truly violent thoughts and then having that start coming out in some of their behaviors where they're willing to push and shove or uh, threaten violence. And only at the high, hottest end do they even hit with the intent to injure 
uh, let alone the most extreme thing being, uh, you know, trying to take someone's life. And when we try to talk about media violence as, you know, as scientists, often the response we get is, well, I watched lots of violent movies and played lots of violent video games, and I never shot anyone. And that's a really inappropriate response in, in many respects, although it has a lot of intuitive appeal. And uh, in this thermometer, I hope, helps to explain. When we're talking about media violence uh, and aggression, we're talking about it as one risk factor. There are 100 known risk factors for aggression, living in poverty, uh, having been abused, uh, having been bullied, uh, being a member of a gang, having uninvolved parents, having psychiatric illnesses, all of these things increase the risk of aggression. Uh, being a boy increases the risk. But not no one of them is the cause. But after school shootings, we ask that question. What's the cause? What caused Sandy Hook school shooting? Well, there was not a single cause. It's a multiple uh, a group of causes that come together to increase the risk in a very predictable way. And so, uh, you know, media violence does not have the power to take a kid who's down here at the cold end and push them all the way up to the top. Thank goodness it's not that big an effect. But it might move you two or three notches. Uh, and so if we say take the, you know, school shooters at Columbine, uh, they had uninvolved parents, okay, you know, add a notch. They had psychiatric illnesses, add another one or two. They had been bullied, add another couple. And yes, they consumed a lot of media violence. That's what, you know, that's the way aggression really works, is there's not a simple mechanistic answer for it. It's you have a complex pattern of risk factors and protective factors, because every protective factor cools it back down, which is why most everyone can say, I watched a lot of this and I never shot anyone. Uh, because, yes, most people actually have a, a fair number of protective factors. They have uh, involved families. They have, uh, you know, friends who are not antisocial. They get reasonable grades in school. All of those things cool it back down. And, you know, so most people will never make it all the way up to the most extreme level here. But that's a different thing from saying, is it having no effect? Because, uh, you know, two-thirds of smokers don't get lung cancer either. Does that mean it had no effect? Well, no, it just means they didn't have enough other risk factors to get the disease. And I recall you're talking um, in January about that analogy and um, the the fact that, that um, media violence is a very strong factor in aggressive behavior, whether it's um, just moving up people up a notch or two or, or uh, however it might play out on this um, metaphorical thermometer. Well, it, it is a. Is that right, or is that? I think that is correct. Uh, it is a strong risk factor, but let me. But it's not the biggest, and it's also not the smallest. It's right in there, about the same size as coming as coming from a broken home, or having been abused as a child. Um, now we know lots of kids who come from broken homes who don't end up being aggressive, and we know lots of kids who are abused as children who don't end up aggressive, but you start putting enough of these risk factors together and then it does become pretty darn predictable. And what makes media violence different from other risk factors is it's easily controllable. Uh, you know, we know that poverty is a risk factor for, for aggression, but we can't just tell the family in poverty, get out of poverty. Uh, you know, if they could, they would, but even that family with very limited means can say, no, you can't play this video game, play this one instead. No, you can't play that. You know, watch that show. Watch this one instead. So that's really the only thing that makes it particularly different from all the other known risk factors for aggression. Right. So there, they say there's some, but, but um, I guess w whatever we can do about um, helping kids develop some resilience and having other nurturing, caring people in their world and those kinds of things, good role models seem like those could also be mitigating factors. Oh, yes, yes, uh, and, and my research not only, and, and not just my research, lots of uh, studies show not only does media violence increase the risk of aggression in a very uh, predictable way, but when parents are involved with their children's media habits, when they set limits on how much time they're allowed to spend with media, and they set limits on the content of the media, that's a powerful protective factor for kids. Those kids uh, you know, get better grades in school and get into fewer fights. 
You know, I wish I'd known all this when my kids were growing up. <laughs> 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 but they've they've all grown up and they're just you know, thirties, almost thirties and thirties, and so they're and they're doing fine. So I guess I guess Good. there were enough protective factors in their lives. Yeah, and that's it. No one, no one show matters. No one video game matters. It is, you know, just the same way no one cigarette matters. It is the accumulation over a long period of time, because what's happening is, you know, I, I, it's not really, you know, it's not brain science. Oh wait, yes, it is. Uh, it's it's learning. That's what's happening. It's that as you know, and humans are fantastic learners. We just need to see something once. And we learn from it. And and but if we see it multiple times, if we practice it a bunch of times, not only do we learn it very well, but we get to the point where it becomes automatic. And that's what's happening. If you spend a lot of time playing violent video games, watching violent movies or TV shows, you start expecting people in the world to act in hostile ways. Uh, you start being hyper vigilant for enemies. Um, you start becoming desensitized to the actual effects of violence and start seeing it as more acceptable. And so then when a kid gets bumped in the hallway, he stops assuming it was an accident and he starts assuming it had hostile intent. You know, the, the other kid was trying to make me mad. And the minute you make that tiny little change in perception, you can easily see how the risk of aggression just went way up because the minute you stop assuming other people are doing things accidentally or for benign reasons and they're doing it intentionally to make you mad, well, you get mad. And the minute you get mad, you're much more likely to say something unkind or push back, and now the odds of aggression go way up. Exactly. Well, that, and that sort of brings up the next slide. Yeah? Um can you turn your phone volume up a little? We have some people that say they cannot hear you very well. Can you turn my phone volume up? Oh, you're no, no, good. Fine. It's Bessie that's okay. the problem. <laughs> okay. Is is that better? That seems better to me. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so the, on the next slide, what I had was some of the, I think a little bit about what you were just talking about is that it's not just, it, it, while one person may become aggressive, you also have somebody who's going to be on the opposite end of that as the victim. And there are some other ways that people may be impacted. So it's not always correct just to think about it as aggression, but there may be other kinds of, of uh, responses. Yeah, that's that's totally correct. There are actually about 19 scientifically documented different effects of media violence, <laughs> um, and uh, they sometimes get summarized as these four. Uh, the first one being the aggressor effect, meaning that as you watch more entertainment violence, you become more willing to behave aggressively. You start seeing it as more acceptable. You start you know, uh, being verbally, you know, uh, and aggression, let, let, we should perhaps define that. Aggression uh, is properly defined as any behavior. So that could be a verbal behavior, a relational behavior, or a physical behavior um, that is intended to harm someone. Um, that's, you know, that's a nice clean definition. It means accidents are not aggression. Sports, most sports are not aggression. Acts of God are not aggression. It has to have intent to harm uh, behind it. And so as people watch a lot of, you know, violent media, they start becoming more willing to have, you know, hostile intent uh, behind their actions. The second effect is the victim effect. And the idea here is that the more of this you watch, the more scared you become. It's sometimes called the mean world syndrome, that you uh, start seeing the world as a very dangerous place. You start initiating more self-protective behaviors, such as kids carrying guns to school, which ironically increases their odds of being shot. The third effect is the bystander effect. The idea here is that the more entertainment uh, violence you watch, the more desensitized you become. And I don't just mean desensitized to other media violence, although that's true. It also desensitizes us to violence in the real world. Um, classic example of this was a, a true experimental study where they randomly assigned uh, young men to watch, I believe it was 20 minutes of a sports program uh, or 20 minutes of a movie that included a simulated rape scene. 
And then they brought in a real woman who had really been raped. And the men who uh, saw the movie with the simulated rape scene were much more callous towards her, much more apathetic, much less empathetic to her real human suffering and pain. 20 minutes of a TV program changed the way they interacted with a real human being. That's kind of scary to me. And the fourth effect is the appetite effect. And simply put, the more you watch, the more you want to watch. And there really isn't much debate in science over these effects. The, the question is not, does it have an effect? The question is, which effect is what kind of kid going to get most? Uh, we know something about that. In general, boys tend to get more of the appetite, the bystander, and the aggressor effects, and girls tend to get more of the victim effect. But basically, it's not an issue of does it have an effect. It's, you know, which of these effects <laughs> is it going to have, you know, most on what type of kid? So, you know, uh, as parents and as teachers being sensitive to what kind of reaction our children may be having, just because they don't start punching people when they um, watch something that's violent, it may, they may be simply um, feeling that sort of bystander effect or, or feeling victimized and like they have to, you know, be more defensive. Yes. Yeah, I think one of the problems in the way this this – uh, scientific discussion usually gets held in the in the public is that we assume incorrectly that if media violence has an effect, it must have one effect. But in fact, it has 19 different effects, and those different effects uh, uh, happen to different kinds of kids or at different developmental stages. Um, and so because we, we look for just one thing, that everyone has that same effect, and, and that's not the way it works, we assume that it must not have any effect. But, uh, you know, that's that's bad scientific reasoning. Yeah. I think that the, um, the point that you just mentioned, which really um, hit home when uh, we listened to you in January, was about the impact of media violence at different ages and at different developmental stages. And so I, my the next slide just um, actually has some pictures of my son at various stages, just to sort of remind us that um, kids are obviously very different at these different stages. So we have Andrew as a baby, and then as a toddler, and as a very young cowboy, and uh, with a gun pointing at us, which I thought was really appropriate. <laughs> and then as an adolescent on his. Uh, rollerblades and he's now married and expecting a child of his own so he's going to have to deal with his own set of problems when uh, in a few years but obviously these we couldn't expect that these kids at different stages were going to be reacting differently um, could you talk a little bit about how it, kids might be impacted at different stages Sure. And this is a fairly complex discussion that I'm going to just uh, not do much justice to in this short time we've got. So if people want a little more detail, um, uh, this is, I believe, chapter two or three in, in my media violence book that uh, goes into more of the detail on this. But basically, at every developmental stage, children have what are uh, called uh, develop, different developmental tasks they need to accomplish. There are certain things that for healthy development they need to figure out, and uh, if they do figure them out, kind of that success sets them up for future successes. And if they don't figure them out well, then that failure kind of sets them up for future failures. And for infants, um, now let me let me... Uh, you know, give I think probably the example I, I likely gave uh, when you heard me is we can take a show that lots of kids are exposed to and ask the question, you know, what effect is this going to have on children? And so uh, I like, uh, as an example, you know, the most popular show uh, among three and four year olds, the highest rated show for three and four year olds for most of the, you know, first decade of this century, and that was Friends. Uh, and that's often surprising to people because that didn't that show it's not targeting preschoolers, but it's targeting twenty and thirty somethings and twenty and thirty somethings tend to have young children and they sit there watching it with them and so lots of kids are exposed to a show that's not designed for them. So I think it's a fair question, you know, what effect might a show like that have? If we think about infants, the primary developmental task of infancy is to form a healthy attachment relationship with a caregiver. And 
it's hard to imagine how a show like Friends is going to have any effect on that at all. So it's probably not going to have much effect on babies at all. Although there is starting to be research showing that even when you think your baby is not or a toddler is not watching the screen because you're watching something that doesn't interest uh, your young child. Uh, it does disrupt their play. They do glance at the screen from time to time. It does. It it actually uh, it hinders the quality of their play. Uh, so it maybe has an effect there. Uh, the but baby version of multitasking. Yeah, it might might be the beginning of it, uh, and the research on multitasking is starting to become pretty clear that actually it's not good for us. Uh, our brains are not truly multitaskers. They are multi-switchers, and every time you switch your attention from one thing to another, you actually uh, lose performance. And so uh, the more we train our brains to do that, actually, we're not necessarily doing a good thing for ourselves. <laughs> But uh, we can talk more about that later if you want. Uh, so for toddlers from about you know one to two and a half years, um, the primary uh, developmental tasks are curiosity and exploration uh, and language learning. And again, this show is not really going to affect uh, a show like Friends isn't going to affect their curiosity or exploration, other than it might. Uh, you know, dampen some of their their good play. Uh, it might have some effect on language learning because at, uh, say, 20 months of age, kids go through what's called the 20-month explosion, where they are picking up 50 new vocabulary words a day. It's just remarkable. 50 new, you know, it's receptive vocabulary, not productive. They can't say all these words. But uh, that means they just have to hear it in free-flowing speech. And so your, uh, your two-year-old may, may learn to say bitch from a show like Friends, which really isn't as cute coming out of a two-year-old's mouth as one might imagine. Um, when you get to uh, preschool age, the primary... Uh, developmental tasks are learning behavioral self-control and emotional self-control. And one of the things that makes a show, you know, a lot of sitcoms funny is that they don't exhibit a whole lot of self-control. Uh, and that, you know, that's what's funny. So what a child might learn from sitting and watching with the parents is that self-control not only is it necessary, but it's good not to. Because that's funny. Your parents laugh at it when someone does something uh, inappropriate or outrageous. But I still think, you know, we're not really getting to the main effects of a show like that until we hit middle childhood, uh, so the elementary school years, where the primary developmental task of that age is learning how to fit into a peer group, learning how to have friends. And so if that's the main thing that you're trying to learn at a given a certain age, what are you going to learn from a show like Friends? Well, how do the friends treat each other on this program, or in most sitcoms for that matter? They are sarcastic and sardonic and caustic with each other, and they think that's funny, and they think that's being friendly. You walk into any seventh grade classroom in this country, and look how they treat each other. They are sarcastic and sardonic and caustic with each other, and they think they're being friendly. <laughs> But there's lots of sexual innuendo in this show. Is a middle childhood kid going to pick that up? Nope, that's going to go right over their head. But you get to adolescence where the primary developmental task, or one of the primary ones, is learning how to have intimate uh, and committed relationships, both same sex and cross sex. And what they're going to learn from a show like this is that all of our relationships are just suffused and dripping with sexuality. So it's a simple question. What effect might a show like Friends have on kids? It's not a simple answer. Depending on the developmental stage of the child, it could have very different effects, which, again, is part of what is going to make us think that, oh, it doesn't really have any effect because we inappropriately think that we should be looking for just one effect. Okay, great. That is, um, I, I just think that's very, very helpful to understand this this whole area. One of the questions that came up um, as people were registering for this webinar was how uh, violence in media or how violence in video games, for example, compares to um, sort of real-life violence and aggression in impacting kids. And it's, uh, how does um, the example that was given was, you know, the little kid who's listening to their parents argue uh, versus the kind of, violence that they would see on their video screen that's part of a game. 
Sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a complicated one to answer. So let me answer a couple different parts of it and uh, see if it makes sense to you. At one level, kind of just the learning from seeing, it seems to have no different effect. That if you see violence in your neighborhood, if you see violence in your home, you learn from it. And if you see it on TV or in a video game, you learn from it. And in that sense, you know, all of those are risk factors for aggression. If you see violence in your neighborhood, your home, uh, that increases the odds that you will behave aggressively in the future, just the same way it does if you see it on the screen. But there are some uh, some differences, I think, that are important. And, and one of those is that when you see violence in the real world, you often get to see the real world consequences. And so if, uh, you know, this is, this is part of what makes rough and tumble play so good for kids. Uh, and the great time, you know, the great thing about rough and tumble play is someone gets hurt. That's actually the good thing because that's the learning moment. Uh, when someone gets hurt, all play stops. Someone's crying, maybe bleeding. Someone gets in trouble, uh, you know, and everything has to revolves around caring for the victim. And that's how kids learn where the line is. That's how they start to learn. I can go this hard, but not this hard. <laughs> um, and similarly, if they're seeing you know violence in the home. Uh, you know, they will learn some things that are true about violence. If, you know, if daddy hits mommy, uh, they learn just how badly hurt mommy really gets and how long that booze lasts and how scared everyone in the house gets and how, <laughs> and, and so they, they learn something, you know, that's, that's very honest. It's not healthy really to have to learn this as a child, but at least it's something true about aggression. Whereas in you know, movies and video games, et cetera, uh, the real consequences are almost never shown. It's sanitized. It's glamorized. It's often done with humor. And so what kids learn from that is that being violent is the good thing because the good guy wins by being more violent, by being better at violence. But that's not true about the real world. And, you know, everyone loses when someone is violent and that uh, and so seeing it in you know in real world actually often teaches uh, that much more complicated lesson that yes yeah, someone won but someone lost and even the winner kind of lost <laughs> and, uh, and now everyone's scared of the winner and so that's you know it's not really uh, as glamorous a thing as it looks like on television or in video games yeah sure not um of, uh, of video games and all of this, I guess if you lump it all together as technology, um, the picture that's on the next slide that Sarah's going to turn to actually shows a family that was in a restaurant that we went to one of the nights that we were there. And if you look closely, you'll see every single person at this table, mom, each one of the kids has their own device. And it just... Um, we we had to laugh because we had been talking about technology, and here was everybody on their own piece of technology. Um, and people start now to talk about addiction, um, whether it's video games or whether it's cell phones or texting or whatever. And is, is the research showing that there is such a thing as a technology or a, a addiction? And if so, um, how do we, um, other than you know, don't use any technology, but are, are there ways to treat it, and is it similar to some of the other addictions? Sure. Well, I started studying this over 10 years ago, actually, um, primarily because I didn't believe, uh, people you know, in the 90s were, were talking about their kids being addicted to video games, and, and I thought, that can't be true. <laughs> That you know, all all the parents mean when they say my kid's addicted to video games is my kid plays a lot, and I don't understand why. And that's different from an addiction. An addiction means damage to functioning. It means damage so severe that you know that that you're damaging multiple areas of your life, uh, not just any one. That, that you have to you know to be an addiction means you're damaging your social functioning, your family functioning, your occupational functioning, your school functioning, your psychological functioning, your emotional functioning. Uh, you know, that's when it becomes rises to the level of a clinical addiction. And I thought, 
that's not what's happening with video games. And so I studied it the way a clinician would study, uh, you know, a true addiction. And it turns out I was wrong. Uh, in fact, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a dying lot of kids who would reach that clinical level. Uh, in one study that I did, uh, I actually got data collected by Harris Polls for me. So this beautiful national, you know, sample of 1,200 kids all across the country. Eight and a half percent of the gamers would classify as addicted by that clinical standard. Now, you know, that means 92 percent aren't addicted. That's, you know, that's what you would expect. It's not, uh, you know, it's not going to affect most of the kids. But eight and a half percent is not a small number. Uh, there are 40 million kids in the U.S. Ninety-two percent of them, them play video games. If eight and a half percent of them are addicted, that's over three million children that should be getting some type of help. Wow. And the problem is they're not getting the help because this has not been a recognized um, uh, medical diagnosis. That said, the newest thing is this uh, month, the American Psychiatric Association is coming out with uh, its new uh, diagnosis codes. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, Version 5, so the DSM-5. It, uh, I believe, is uh, being released this month or next. And for the first time ever, it is going to have a diagnosis of online gaming disorder is what they're calling it. So uh, it, it's... Uh, and, and I've talked to some of the people who were on the committee reviewing, and you know, this was a very long, multiple-year process of trying to decide what, of all the things we talk about addictions, we talk about shopping addiction and sex addiction and TV addiction and cell phone addiction and you know, Facebook addiction and video gaming addiction, et cetera, which of them really have sufficient scientific evidence to say this is a real problem? And it turns out only the gaming. All those other ones, they felt were not well supported by the science. So Internet in general did not make the list, but Internet gaming <laughs> uh, does. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is hopeful to me because it means, you know, of these kids who should be getting help, uh, now maybe they can get help because up until now, even you know most of most of the therapists didn't even believe it was a real problem, and even if you got one to take it seriously, there wasn't a way your insurance could pay for it because it's not a diagnosable disease, or, or it hadn't been. So I'm I'm very hopeful that that's all going to be changing now. Are there um, uh, are people have people been successfully treating this, and what kinds of approaches have they been taking? Well, um, this is not where I'm an expert on the literature because uh, I'm not a therapist, so I, I don't know a whole lot about it. That said, there are lots of studies out there uh, where people do claim to have been treating it successfully. Um, generally, cognitive behavioral uh, types of treatments seem to work. And, I, and the way I, I tend to think about this, and again, I'm not an addiction specialist and I'm not a clinician. Um, so this is, this is purely my opinion. But I tend to think of this as an impulse control disorder. You know you should do your homework, but you just can't stop playing. You know you should go to sleep, but you just want one more level. And what we would need to do then is teach uh, children to recognize when they're having the impulse that they want to play and stop at that minute to decide is this a, fair t a good time to do it or not? Do I need to do something or do I need to finish my homework first uh, or get my chores done or spend time with my family? And, and if those things are done, then fine, I can play now. Um, and so the type of therapist that would be good at treating that would be uh, probably either someone who specifically specializes in impulse control disorders or perhaps in chemical dependency uh, problems. So, so that's you know there there aren't a lot of people. I guess my uh, my Google, my Google uh, habit is is not is is not a control yet, so I don't have to worry. So. <laughs> well, and and also think about why are you spending your time? You know, I spend a darn lot of time on email. When I can't be on email, I get anxious, um, which I recognize is one of the symptoms, uh, but of an addiction. It's a withdrawal symptom. Um, but why am I on email? Is that, 
rely on it because it hurts me or because it helps me. And it turns out that that's important for my job, so therefore it's actually helping my job, so it's not dysfunctional. And so that's, you know, there's really the, 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 you know, the, the line is, is it damaging functioning or is it enhancing functioning? Right, right. Another um, area that um, that video games have been um, uh, blamed for having some negative effects are attention, and I believe that you've done some research in that area as well. I think this is a picture of you with one of your doctoral students. Uh, yeah, that's uh, 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 Dr. Ted, Ted Swing. Uh, they're standing next to me. And uh, he was particularly interested in uh, attention, partly because there's a, been a lot of research on uh, with violent video games, actually, looking at how they may improve certain types of perceptual attention uh, skills, so that uh, there's a great line of research that shows that the more people play what, what the authors usually call action games, but in practice actually are you know, violent first-person shooters. Uh, it widens their useful field of view so they can see farther out into the periphery. It makes them uh, better able to detect, to detect tiny changes uh, and then reorient their attention towards it very quickly. And so uh, those studies have been showing that, you know, these aspects of attention can be trained by video games. But when we think about attention the way a parent or educator thinks about it is different from that. Uh, they think about sustained and focused attention, not able to notice tiny little distractions and reorient quickly. And so we wondered, well, is, it, is this effect actually a good effect for attention the way educators mean it? And so we started doing some studies, uh, and we found that in, in two different large-scale longitudinal studies, one with over 1,300 kids uh, followed for uh, over a year, and another with over 3,000 kids followed for three years, uh, we find that the kids were spending more time in front of screens, watching television and uh, playing video games. Their attention uh, problems went up, uh, as rated by their teachers, for example, which is remarkable because the teachers don't know what they're seeing at home, but they can see the performance drop in school. And, and people often think, uh, you know, they have two problems with this research. One is that, you know, we've all been trained to think that attention deficit problems are purely biological or genetic. Um, but that's just because that's where we focus the attention in research for the past 30 years. And, and that focus has led to fantastic breakthroughs in medications. But it's left parents feeling really powerless because when, you know, your teacher calls and says, Johnny's got a problem with attention, the parent doesn't know what to do other than to medicate. That really shouldn't be their only first choice. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we really haven't looked at the environmental side, uh, what might be uh, either helpful for attention or harmful for it. And so these studies actually, I think, are, are good news for parents because they show that, yes, the, you know, the amount of time kids spend in front of screens is predicting worse attention problems. Uh, so that gives parents a first thing to do. If your child's starting to exhibit you know, more problem maintaining and sustaining focused attention, uh, then cutting back on the screen time is a good first step. It may not be enough. You might still need to medicate, but at least it's something they can try first. Interesting. And um, the other side of this, of course, is that there are people um, who have talked about, as you you, know, you said, the, the, there are some positive um, attentional control things that people have said can um, be de or are developed by video games. That most video games, of course, aren't designed necessarily to do that. They're designed for other reasons, but incidentally have some of these impacts. But um, this is a list I found somewhere that just sort of struck me because it was so long about things that people have claimed um, can actually be improved by video games. Um, and could you talk a little bit about more? I mean, you talked about um, capturing fine cells and reorienting and things like that. Are there other skills that you think um, can be developed via a video game? 
Oh, certainly. Uh, and, and I think that's important to, to raise is, you know, we're not talking about media as bad. The, the, if there's one theme in my research is that media are powerful. <laughs> they have a far larger effect than we wish to believe. And that is, you know, both a far larger, larger positive effect as well as a far larger negative effect. So, uh, uh, if I can digress for a moment, uh, one example of this is, uh, when shows are designed or games are designed specifically to have an effect, uh, they they are fantastic at that. So uh, most research, for example, has been done with Sesame Street. And research shows that if uh, preschoolers are watching Sesame Street uh, most days, they're still getting better grades in high school. Wow. Twelve years later, you can still see the effect of that one show. You know, that's really remarkable, and that's, that's the power that the media have. And so they not only have these effects when, when it's intentional, such as advertising and educational media, but they have effects when it's unintentional, such as media violence and most of these things. Yes, kids do learn fantastic hand-eye coordination, at least in terms of uh, joystick control from video games, but um, they would learn just as much and maybe more from throwing a ball. <laughs> So it's not that I disagree with anything on this list, actually. You know, there's great studies on, on most of these things on the list here that I'm aware of. And I'll tell you about one I did. We did a study with uh, laparoscopic surgeons. Um, and now, a laparoscopic surgeon is the kind of surgeon who doesn't have her hands inside you, but instead uh, has three or four centimeter long holes, has a light stuck in through one of those holes, a camera in through another, and then uh, the surgical tools in through the others. And the surgeon's looking up at a screen. And we had surgeons coming in for advanced surgical training that included timed and scored and uh, drilled, so we could actually see who is the better surgeon. We had them play three video games before doing uh, these drills just to see how good they were at video games. And we also gave them a survey to find out how much they would played video games in the past. And the, the amazing thing is that uh, surgeons who had played video games for at least three hours a week in the past were 27% faster and made 37% fewer errors than surgeons who had not played video games in the past. And that's remarkable because when you think about surgery, speed and errors don't usually go together like that. You don't usually want your surgeon going faster. Uh, but in fact, if they played games in the past, they were both faster and more accurate. But the real surprise was when we looked at just trying to predict who's the best surgeon. The single best predictors, the two best predictors of how good they were at actual surgical skills were how much they played video games in the past and how good they were at playing video games today. That beat how many years of medical training they had had. That beat how many surgeries they had actually performed in their careers. It's just remarkable. Now, the games they were playing were the same off-the-shelf games that you and I play. They, uh, they weren't playing surgical simulators. And the only way I can understand that effect, because it's not an effect of the content of the game, and it's not an effect of how much they played. In fact, they didn't play all that much. Three, three hours a week is way less than the average uh, uh, you know, child nowadays. In fact, if you play the average amount a child does, you probably won't get into medical school. Uh, but the way I can understand it is what they are learning is a bunch of the things on this list you have here, hand-eye coordination, fine motor skills, spatial skills, planning, accuracy, uh, mapping, uh, being able to maintain uh, three-dimensional spherical awareness of yourself in space, even though you've just got a two-dimensional uh, representation, uh, also getting depth information out of that two-dimensional representation. So all of those types of skills were picked up from playing video games, even though they didn't think that's what they were training when they were playing them. They were just playing the game for fun. That is fascinating. I guess the, my list of questions, when I have to, if I ever have to interview a surgeon, will be different than it used to be. <laughs> well, yeah, I think the first question still should be, how many of these surgeries have you done in your career? But maybe the second question should be, are you a gamer? <laughs> there you go. Um, one of the ways that, that um, parents, uh, many parents, rely on to um, help them sort of guide their children and make some decisions about what uh, products, uh, what media products their kids should be using or would be okay for them are the 
media ratings. And I know you've research in this area, and maybe you could talk about um, how good these ratings are and and then how the best um, educators and, and parents can uh, can use them. Sure. Well, um, I, my my answer to this is that some information is better than none. So using the ratings is better than not using them. Already that, and, and so that's a useful thing to teach parents, is that the ratings actually give them uh, some useful information, and if they set some limits on their, you know, what their kids can see based on the ratings, that will actually act as a protective factor. The problem is the ratings themselves actually are really, really bad. They often don't match. They, they have very low validity, by which I mean if you show a rating to a parent and then show them what's in that you know, game or film, the parents are often surprised that they did not expect to see that based on that rating, that often lots of stuff gets in that, that, would, that parents would not agree go with that rating. And in fact, we did a couple national surveys recently uh, published in the journal Pediatrics where we actually showed that the real problem is with an age-based system, like all of these ratings are. They're based on uh, something that, you know, sometimes they're vague about age, you know, general to parental guidance to PG-13. You get a sense of there's an age under there, but you don't know quite what it is, whereas uh, with video game ratings, it's a little clearer. Everyone's six and up, everyone ten and up, teen and uh, mature. But uh, we asked parents, we gave them 37 different specific types of detailed content, and we said, what's the minimum age that you know, kids should be to be able to see this? Parents never agree, basically not once, on all of these different types of content, with the exception of explicit pornographic sex. That's the only one parents agree on. <laughs> uh, uh, parents never agree, which means that the whole idea of an age-based system is an error. That if parents are, if families are really different in their values about these things, then giving them a suggested age will be wrong for over 50% of the families necessarily. Uh, and so what we should be doing is having content-based ratings that, that just tell the parents, here's what's in it. And then every family can make a decision based on their particular values, whether that's appropriate for their kids or not. So what can parents and educators do? Well, I'd love to see them uh, you know, starting to put pressure politically to have uh, one universal rating system. Uh, because, you know, and that's not, all of these ratings, by the way, are controlled by the industries. They're not controlled by law. The industry, you know, it's movie, it's, you know, movie system rates its own, video games rate their own, TV, each station, each network rates its own, which is why you can see the same movie on two different networks and it has totally different ratings. Um, and so it's, you know, we've left the kids in control of the candy store and they don't really want the ratings to be good. That might actually harm their profits, although I don't think they would. Uh, but that's, I think, the fear they have. And so I, I think we need to be doing something to try to change ratings drastically. Have one system so that rather than all these different ones, do you understand all 11 symbols of the TV rating system? No, I haven't a clue. Yeah, well, and, and my you know feeling about it is they don't really want people understanding it. Uh, it's, 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 you know, if it's confusing, then that's, you know, that's kind of good in some, you know, they can say, look, we've got it, but no one uses it, uh, which is the case. If we ask parents, uh, you know, how, how use, you know, how accurate are they, uh, only 6% of parents say they're always accurate. So parents can tell they're not good, and then parents don't use them. And so we're giving up that one piece of information we have, which although it's not very good, it's still better than nothing. Now, there are also lots of websites out there where you can get more information. You can go actually onto YouTube and watch video clips of people playing video games because 
gamers are happy to show you how good they are at you know ripping people's heads off. And once you see that, you know what's in the game, and then, <laughs> then you can make a very informed decision. So there are lots of ways now with the Internet to actually get a lot more information about what's in a given show, movie, or a video game uh, than we had in the past. And, and I think that's probably the best thing is to spend a little time uh, you know, doing research before you decide whether to allow your child to go see a certain movie or uh, buy a certain game. That makes a lot of sense because a a lot of cases you're going to get pretty quickly. It's not like you have to go watch the whole movie necessarily or play the whole game. You're going to get probably within a minute or two, you're going to have a pretty strong feeling for whether or not it's appropriate. That's true. And there are some, for for movies, for example, uh, there's a a woman, uh, I think it's Nell Minow, who who, uh, has a website, moviemom.com. And I think she does a fantastic job of uh, not only, you know, trying to explain what's in a film that parents might be concerned about, but then she goes beyond that and she says, here are things, if you, you know, let your child see this, here are questions to ask your child about it. Because one of the other things we know from the uh, parental monitoring literature is that uh, although setting limits on amount and content, both of those matter, the single best thing parents can do is to actually discuss the media that their children you know, see. And so uh, when you have these discussions, and it's not just about what you like or don't like, although that's one way of doing it, but it's better to do it through a series of questions, get the child to tell you what he or she thinks, and then you can react to that, uh, get them to think about why did it, why was it portrayed this way, uh, you know, what uh, what else? How else could it have been portrayed? How does that match with the way people really act? Uh, why? Uh, why did they show you a very unrealistic portrayal? Um, what does it mean when you know the uh, you know the heroine is scantily clad? <laughs> you know, basically, get them to think about the meaning behind the messages. That's a powerful protective factor that mitigates almost all of the negative effects. And it enhances almost all the positive effects of the media. And so one of the things I like about the Movie Mom website is she gives parents a lot of those types of questions because it's not something most parents do intuitively. If they even talk about the media, they either just tell, say what they like or don't like, they give their opinions. And kids don't really want to hear that. Uh, so it's not really effective. Or they do the wrong things where they just, you know, I know lots of dads who sit in with their little kids uh, playing you know, violent video games and talking about how cool it is that you can shoot someone in the face. And so that is you know, reinforcing perhaps all the wrong messages. Uh, unless you want your son to grow up to be a cyborg warrior, and uh, then maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> well, I, Doug, I, you have some kids of your own, as I recall. Um, what have you, do you, are there two or three things that you have um, – sort of rules that you have with your kids or things that you do that uh, based on all of your research um, over the last number of years? Well, as you can imagine, I'm very, very strict (laughs) about media with my kids. Uh, But uh, I think the thing that, that other people have told me and that I've seen now with my own kids as well is that if you get into this habit early on of discussing the media you watch, discussing the meaning, the messages, why you choose to watch certain things, why you don't choose to watch certain things, Um, then when your kid goes across the street and sees something at Johnny's house you would never have let your child see, they come home, they tell you about it, and you still get the opportunity to talk to them about it and help mitigate any of the harms. But not only that, they start internalizing for themselves that this is what they want, and, and this kind of bit me in the butt. Uh, when my older daughter turned 10, I was finally willing to let her watch you know, the original Star Wars film, uh, which you know, that came out when I was a 13-year-old boy. That was an important film for me. <laughs> and I wanted to share it with my daughter. And when she turned 10, I said, okay, let's watch this. And she refused. No, Dad. Oh, please. No, it's got people fighting. I don't want to watch that. Oh, please watch it with me. No, I don't want to see people shooting at each other all movie. And she, she had internalized it to, her, you know, to the point where she refused to watch it with me <laughs> for years. So, you know, that's, that's what every parent's dream is, I think, that, you know, we want them 
to be able to stick up for themselves, to know what's healthy for themselves and uh, what's not, and then you know, and then have their own motivations to do it or or not do it. You know, that's why we give kids an allowance. We don't give them an allowance because we think kids need money. We give it to them so that they can learn. Uh, that if they blow it all at once, which of course the first two you know, years they have an allowance, that's what the minute you give it to them, they blow it all in candy. And then later on, they wish they hadn't. And that's the learning. <laughs> and over time, they learn to budget and they learn to save for things that they want. And by the time they leave your house, hopefully they've gotten those skills internalized and and uh, you know, you're not the one having to balance their checkbook for them. They've figured it out on their own by that point. And so that's what I think is really the most important thing is starting these conversations. Now, if your kid's already a teenager, it's going to be tough. Uh, it's still worth doing, but it's going to be much, much harder. And therefore, you know, really the questioning approach is going to be much, much better uh, than a, you know, a dictating approach. But uh, setting, you know, limits on how much uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends uh, no screens at all until age three, <laughs> based on what we know about what builds healthy brains. They say one hour a day total screen time. So that's add up every screen. That's computer and DVDs and television and video games and handheld video games and, uh, and iPad and iPhone. And, you know, add it all up. should be no more than one hour a day. And for secondary school, it should be no more than two hours a day of total screen time. And they also say never put a TV in child's bedroom. Uh, and, and the research on this is starting to become very, very clear that uh, it's a, that's a very big risk factor for kids. Uh, when kids have a TV in the bedroom, it, uh, uh, first of all, they spend way more time, about eight and a half hours more a week watching television. Their video game time doubles. And uh, parents are less able to monitor what their children see and hear. They're less able to have consistent rules in the house for children's media use. Children participate in fewer alternatives to electronic media. So they read less. They do fewer sports. They have fewer hobbies. They go to the library less. They play fewer games. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe you don't care about that, but here's one parents do care about. They get worse grades in school if there's a TV in the bedroom. And the risk of obesity goes up 31% just by virtue of sticking that box in the bedroom. So this is a question every parent will be faced with, and there's a simple two-letter answer in the English language that uh, the parents should use. Does it have an N and an O in it? Yeah, yeah, in, in, in some combination. <laughs> not on. <laughs> well, not then turn it off. Actually, it could be the three-letter word off or the two-letter word no. Well, this is not really uh, yeah. You've you really um, presented some, shared with us some really eye-opening things. And if if any, I, I suspect the people who were uh, tuned in today um, s sort of had some concerns about this area and hopefully have some more ammunition and some information on which to um, engage in discussions with their kids at least, as well as with maybe their colleagues and spouses and friends and, and all of that kind of thing. I don't know if we have time. Were there any questions that popped up, Sarah? There were some. There's one that I think we probably should take it just a couple minutes to um to answer and the and the rest probably can can um not can be tabled. But it was um and it was regarding when when Doug was talking about the laparoscopic surgeon um research um, and the question being, wouldn't this apply only to laparoscopic surgeons whose real-life job skills more closely match video game modalities and techniques? And I thought you might want to comment on that. No, that's a good question. Uh, we don't know the answer. Um, the reason we started with laparoscopic surgeons is because it does most closely uh, match because you know, these surgeons are looking at a screen. And the research on this is basically a question of transfer uh, of learning. And the research on transfer is that uh, transfer, you know, the farther you get away from the original learning environment and, and uh, context, the less transfer happens. And so if we went to a different type of surgeon, probably the effect uh, is at least lowered and it may go away entirely. Um, when we look at 
Um, you know, so when people talk about all the, all the benefits of violent games on, say, visual attention skills, um, you know, if your kid wants to be an air traffic controller, <laughs> managing lots of data points on a screen uh, in real time, being you know, able to take them all in at one glance and notice where the problems are and quickly, you know, divert your attention there, that is probably really useful. But those same skills are not so useful when the kid's sitting in the classroom and you're supposed to ignore the child sitting next to you fidgeting. So, so that's you know, a really important you know, part of this issue is that people like to take some of these studies and then make big pronouncements about how good games are or how bad games are. Um, and that's, I think, really inappropriate. You know, the research shows that they are very effective teaching tools, um, and what they teach is often not what you necessarily expect <laughs> them to teach, um, but they're having multiple effects all at once. So if your child is spending a lot of time playing Grand Theft Auto, a lot of time probably means poor school performance. The violent content probably means you know, increased aggressive thoughts and feelings and maybe at some point in the future behaviors. The fact that they have to, uh, it's both a driving game and a shooting game, might mean improved uh, two-dimensional to three-dimensional transfer skills, improved targeting skills, improved field of view. Uh, if they play with other friends online, maybe some of these effects are in enhanced because you're getting social support, for example, for being uh, violent. And if you play on a mouse and keyboard, your mouse and keyboard skills improve. So is it good or bad? Well, it really depends which of those effects you care most about. And, and so I think you know, this is a really important question that uh, we don't want to generalize too much from some of these studies to make a, make a pronouncement that games are either, you know, uh, good or bad, they are good and bad in a certain context, depending on what skill you have. The, the increased aggression skills, for example, while they're probably not a good thing in terms of society, uh, you know, they're very good for the armed services, which is why all branches of the armed services use video games to train soldiers. Well, you've certainly um, sort of uh, got us to be much more aware, I think, of the complexity of this and the multiple effects. Um, Clearly, the the one clear um, takeaway for me is that they are they are having a tremendous impact um, that includes some good and some bad, and I think it's just helpful for all of us to be more aware of that and to understand it. So, that going. No, it's true. Can't... I think the the, oh. the goal really is that once you understand what the effects are, then you can maximize the benefits and minimize the harms. Right, right. So, thank you so much for. Um, uh, making us more aware and for sharing some thoughts with us. And um, we really appreciate it. And uh, we want to thank everybody also for attending today. And we hope everybody has a great rest of the afternoon. Great. And uh, I saw you had my website address up there. People can go actually look at some of the, uh, the actual... Oh, I did, uh, I, I did uh, want to reinforce that because... Some great stuff on your website, and uh, people really should go check it out. It's if you have questions in this area or want to explore them further, I just it's a great place to go. Is anything you else, anything else you wanted to add, Doug? I think the, you know the, the one take home is that parents are in a much more powerful position than they realize. Uh, parents often feel out of control, especially if you know the kid understands the technology better than the parents. But uh, but really, when parents are setting limits on amount and content and talking to them about what they're seeing and hearing, it's a powerful protective factor for kids. I really can't stress that enough. And the other thing, uh, you know, for your, anyone who takes this research seriously is going to get some pushback. People do not want to believe it. Um, there is, you know, and then there are multiple billion dollar industries out there that don't want you to believe it either. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, lot of pushback. And I think that, you know, the way to really uh, just understand it for yourself uh, is, you know, all of these effects are learning. These are, that's, you know, learning from educational television and learning from violent television are exactly the same. You can't only learn one thing. <laughs> uh, whatever you practice, you will get better at. And your grandmother was a great neuroscientist. She told you practice makes perfect, and she was right. 
No, what we do, our brains become, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so if you thought no, that uh, stuff, all of it is we're, our brains learn. That's what they were engineered to do. Exactly. Okay. Well, thanks again, and um, thank you for joining us and for all of your great insights. And uh, uh, we'll again with the report post the recording um, in a week or so, maybe a little less, and um, we hope everybody will join us for another Neuroscience and Education webinar, and uh, thanks again. Great, thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.